Okay, so uh, any questions from the past two chapters? I mean, chapter two and chapter three? You know, including you guys who are just sit in the class. I mean, that's fine, perfectly fine. But if you have questions, you know, please feel free to ask. Okay. Uh, any questions? No. Okay. So, okay. So today we'll talk about chapter four, and then uh, basically section five point one, and a little bit at the beginning of section five point two, and then uh, chapter six we will basically talk about uh, section 6.1. Okay, we're not going into the quantum mechanics because that's, uh, that's way too much uh, for students with the engineering background. Okay, and so if you really want to learn uh, quantum mechanics, then, then you have to go to the physics department and you know, take the quantum courses over there. Okay, so this chapter four, um, again, the first slide just to uh, outline what we are going to talk about. Okay, so we're going to talk about this magnetization, and then again the Bly equation. Okay, so you say, well, you know, it looks like the same Bly equation. Yes, it is. Okay, and then the potential energy, and we talk about the T1. What's T1? Uh, it's that longitudinal spin lattice relaxation time, and then what's T2? Okay, we call that actually a transverse spin-spin relaxation time. And then there's a name, I mean a phrase, I mean a terminology I, I just discovered from the textbook, right? No, it has been there, I mean, it has been there for, for, for more than a decade. Um, this defacing, okay, so I just have to explain that. Okay, so to start with, the, uh, this, the first thing is that you see this magnetization M Okay, and but this is actually okay. So you look at the definition and say, okay, this is really nothing, because in chapter two and chapter three we're just talking about, uh, you know, one single, say, spin or proton, and we use the uh, symbol mu to represent that spin or proton, and but now the the point is we're not imaging just one spin, you know, we are imaging actually so many spins inside our body. By the way, we're talking about protons, okay? not electrons, protons. So we have so many protons inside our body, and so imagine that, well, okay, then we're not looking, we're not imaging one single guy, we're basically, we're applying this field, I mean the main field, and then our pulse on all these spins. So then, yes, you imagine that we have to add up all these, all the contributions from all these spins, right? So let's say I use my fingers each finger represents one spin, so at least you know I got ten spins here. And so when I add them up, and then divided by the volume I'm looking at, well, then that is this uh, uh, term. I mean phrase magnetization. Okay, so there's no magic. I mean just add up all the magnetic moment of each spin. Okay, so that's a sum over this mu and then divide by the volume. That's the magnetization. Okay, now, the second bullet is actually what I really have to warn you, and you really have to be very careful in this book. This terminology, magnetization, is pretty much what we use uh, throughout this book, okay, uh, including in chapter 25. So you will see magnetization, but throughout this book, this word magnetization, in fact, is referred to the uh, magnetization from protons. But in chapter 25, you will also see this uh, phrase magnetization, and the bad news is that I actually use the same symbol uh, M with a vector, and that actually will refer to magnetization from electrons. And, and in chapter 25, we will talk about the magnetic susceptibility, but the susceptibility effect in, is actually from electrons, not from protons. Okay, so so that's where you have to be very careful. In most cases, this uh, capital M represent the magnetization from protons in this book, but not from chapter 25. Okay, so then the third bullet, of course, it becomes very obvious, right? So if I have uh, 
Bly equation, I mean, okay, this is the Bly equation you have seen from chapter two. So this is the Bly equation, and now I have a whole bunch of spins. And then, of course, automatically I can write down an equation like that. Okay, so, I, so basically you say, oh yeah, okay, it's the same equation, yes. Okay, and then, um, then the, uh, the last one is, of course, again, you have the, so now if we say, again, if I just consider a field pointing to the z direction, and then you can decouple, uh, you can decouple this uh, Bly equation, and such that the z component, you just have the simple equation. Now that's, this is really because the field is pointing to a z direction. Okay? And, then, and then you have the tangential part, okay, tangential part we just, use the symbol perpendicular to represent the tangential part. I mean, meaning that the field, along the field direction, we call that the longitudinal direction, and then the plane perpendicular to this tangential direction is considered as the transverse plane. So, and that's the, kind of we also would say, the tangential part of the, or the transverse, okay? So again, it's just a symbol, but, but just, Realize that this is actually also a vector, and so you still have the x, y uh, uh, component in there. Okay, so the next thing is actually in this chapter, you also say, talk about this uh, potential energy. Okay? And the first thing is say, okay, what is the potential energy? Well, okay, you, know, you, you kind of learned that in the freshman physics. I see. Um, so in, in Freshman physics, actually you learn, you, you have seen the potential energy, I mean E equals to minus mu dot B, okay? And, and the minus sign actually is important, okay? But, but let, let me talk about actually this mu dot B first. So I have a, I have a spin right here. And, and that, uh, the, its magnetic moment is that mu. And then B is actually the external field we are applying. And so just imagine that is a fixed field. And then I have this uh, magnetic moment, okay? So then when I want to calculate this potential energy due to the magnet, due to the magnet of this little spin, it is uh, defined as mu dot B. Okay, so then now why we have this minus sign? Well, the minus sign just simply says in convention, you know, in physics, actually the lower energy, the more stable. So that is actually uh, why we add that minus sign. Okay? So this means, okay, so then with that minus sign, then it tells us the following. So if I have this little spin here, so you have an external field pointing this way, I have this little spin, and if this spin aligns itself parallel to the main field, then the inner product, of course, gives me the, uh, the maximum value, right? But then the minus sign, of course, brings my value to the, lower, to the uh, smallest uh, value in terms, of, um, in terms of the convention. Now, if I have, so now if this spin, on the contrary, if this spin actually is anti-parallel to the main field, then you know you're inner product, your dot product, of course, gives you a negative value. And with that minus sign, the energy becomes actually the greatest number, okay? So in that case, yes, you have a very high energy and it means that actually unstable. I mean, not compared to the lower energy. Okay, so that's basically what the second bullet is about. All right, and then of course, this equation will be Again, you know, modify a little bit, change it a little bit, because again, we are <coughs> thinking about a whole bunch of spins here. And so, again, we have to just rewrite this equation in terms of magnetization M, rather than just uh, a single uh, spin, single problem. Okay, so then we, we basically just rewrite this equation becomes minus M dot B, okay? But you notice that, of course, the unit is not right, because by definition, this 
magnetization M is just the sum of a whole bunch of uh, little magnets divided by a volume. So this definition, in fact, gives us energy density rather than the energy itself. Okay, so U here is just the energy density. And so how do you get the energy? Well, okay, you have to take this guy, integrate over the entire space to get the energy, to get the total energy. Okay, the last bullet, of course, is the, uh, okay, this is a little bit hard, actually, because I'm even reading this again, you know, myself, uh, of the textbook. So, you know, from the equation, it looks simple, okay? So basically, this is just the Curie's law, and the Curie's law basically says, oh, okay, this uh, magnetization, well, in fact, in this case, it's the equilibrium, equilibrium magnetization. It just means that, you know, if all the spins, you wait for a long enough time, then hopefully all these spins actually will become, say, parallel to the field, okay? Be that's because that gives me the lowest energy. Okay, you hope actually that's the case, but of course, you, you will have to wait really forever. So, but that's, that's the kind of the definition of this equilibrium uh, magnetization. Okay, and, now, and this magnetization actually, by Curie's law, is proportional to how large your external field will be, or say is, and inversely proportional to the temperature of the environment. Okay, and it is the latter which is uh, important. Okay. Now this equation actually is related to this uh, section 6.1. Okay. So, so we'll talk about more when, when we are there. So meaning that toward the end of this course, you know, uh, this class, we will talk about that. So we will need this Curie's law again. Okay, so now let's get to the, uh, the main point, okay, the T1 relaxation, okay, so, so what's uh, basically T1 and T2 are what we are going to talk about in this lecture. So what's T1? Well, so you imagine the following, right? So now we say I have the main field here. I have this little spin here. Okay, again, just one spin. So I somehow, uh, okay, now of course from chapter three, you know I can just apply an RF pulse and somehow just rotate this little spin, or say tip down this spin onto the transverse plane like that, and then I turn off the RF pulse. So after I turn off the RF pulse, what is this spin going to do? Well, okay, you say, well, yes, from the, uh, you know, chapter two, right? So if I have a main field pointing this way, I have a spin pointing this way at the very beginning, and I don't have any other fields, I don't have any other spins, then this little spin is going to precess around this main field, right? And this is what we learned from chapter two. Okay, but, but it's more complicated than that. What's going to happen is that this little spin, in fact, has a tendency to align itself with this main field. Okay, so just imagine the following. Imagine that, you know, if you take a little magnet, a bar magnet, little bar magnet, and you, you, you just pull on the, uh, on, the, on the desk here, right? And what will that do? Well, you will try to align itself to the Earth magnetic field. Okay, so this is, it's a little bit like, like that. Okay, so I have a little bit, I have a little spin here. I have a main field pointing this way. This magnet, this spin, this problem is, is trying, or say it's really the spin, is trying to align itself back to the main field. Okay. So this, say, uh, mechanism, or let's say how fast you know, this little spin will align itself back to the main field direction is this graph is governed by this time T1. So actually, so then it's very funny to, to say T1 relaxation, that terminology sounds actually very funny, okay, relaxation. I mean, it's not relaxation, it tries to re align itself back to the main field, okay. So I'd rather actually use a phrase, say T1 regrow okay, or, or T1 interaction. I mean, the, the word relaxation just actually sounds a little bit funny. 
Okay, but anyway, it's it's just a name, so it doesn't matter. So that's why I wrote there. Okay, recovery, T1 recovery, or T1 uh, growth. Um, and the equation to describe that is this. Okay, now remember, if I don't have T1, if I don't have this mechanism, I don't have this interaction, the the Bly equation I just showed you from the previous slide is what? Is this dmz dt equals to zero? Okay, if I have the main field pointing to the z direction, then I I just have dmz the z component of uh, dm dt is zero. But because of this T1 uh, mechanism or re T1 recovery, then the equation becomes this. Okay. Now, there is, of course, a reason to write like this because the solution of this differential equation actually looks like this. Now, if you plot it, you say you look like this, this curve looks like that. Okay. Now, the usual way actually I'll tell students is this. Okay, so it's hard to remember, okay? It's hard to remember this stuff. But from your past experience, actually, you already know what's this. Well, this is just like you have a battery, you try to charge a battery, okay? You learn this, again, in freshman physics. If you have a battery, you try to recharge your battery, it, the, if, just imagine that this vertical uh, coordinate actually is the number of charges, and then horizontal curve is time, it takes basically the same thing for the charges to reach maximum. Okay? So at the very beginning, when you charge, say, your cell phone, right, it takes a very short time, and then you, know, you get maybe a, a, a few in indicators. Not all of them, but quickly you get a few indicators up to here. Okay? But then from this point to this point, even though it takes the same amount of time, you know, just try to get the last indicator of your cell phone to be fully charged. You know, you, I think you all have the experience. It takes almost the same amount of time to chart, to wait for the last indicator, you know, to be the full strength. So one way to remember this is just remember your cell phone battery, all right? So, um, or your, your iPad, iPad battery, and you just have to recharge your battery. This is similar to the T1 uh, recovery. And and because of this, okay, so, so again, this is just like I have the main field here, I have the little spin here, right? It tries to recover itself, uh, align itself to the uh, main field direction. And because of that, you know, you would actually write an equation like, like this for your blah equation, okay? So this is actually important to, to remember. Now, if you look at the structure of this equation, okay, now what's important is you look at the structure of this equation. Okay, notice that actually there is this term there. There is this one there. Okay? So, so now, of course, if you plug in your numbers, I mean, okay, in this case, actually, there is no number. Okay, so when t equals to t naught, that's at this point. Right? So everything, in fact, if you put in there, you find out, oh, yeah, you, you don't have any magnetization. It's a zero at the very beginning. Okay? And then when the time becomes infinite, yes, then we'll recover the uh, complete uh, magnetization. So that's what I mean. This is the equilibrium magnetization. OK, we'll come back to this a uh, uh, little bit later okay, when we look at all the numbers uh, from tissues. OK, this, this, the, this one is about the T2, right? So I talk about the T1. Now I talk about T2. So, so what's T2? Okay, now this is a little bit complicated, okay? Because now just imagine, so originally I have one spin, okay? Now, so, so don't worry about the main field, okay? Assume that the main field is not there. So, I, so I have, originally I have one spin, but now imagine actually I have a whole bunch of spins, right? So let me just bring another spin. And these guys actually are very close to each other because remember, these are your protons, your atoms. So, so they are pretty close to each other. Okay. So, so then here, here is the trouble. Each spin is like a little magnet. So each little magnet, of course, is producing field as well. 
So what is this magnet, this spin going to do to this guy? Well, of course, you know, it's going to either uh, repel this guy or uh, attract this guy, right? Okay, but anyway, it, it's, it's going to do something to this guy. And same thing, this guy is going to do, is going to influence this spin. Okay, now the problem is that it's not just these two spins, we got a whole bunch of spins within a given bottom. So all these guys, so let's say this guy is going to be influenced by, by all the neighboring spins. Okay, so at the very beginning you may think that, oh, well, you know, because of, so for this guy to influence this guy, if I, if I somehow I can just fix the uh, direction of this spin, and this guy is going to be move, going to be rotated or, you know, like this, for example, repel it, okay, or uh, attract it, no matter which way. I'm going to repel a little bit, right? And this guy is going to influence the next guy. So the next guy was like this, okay? So, <laughs> so this guy is precise, like rotated to this direction. This guy is going to be further uh, rotated toward this direction. So now if I have a whole bunch of guys and they influence with each other, well, then you say, well, okay, then, then what's the total signal? Okay, so originally, if I have a, you know, assume all these guys, if, if all these guys are far apart, and then I, I say, well, okay, you know what, I, I, can, just in, I can just have a, a very strong feel, and all these guys will just line them up like this, if, if each guy is far apart, okay? So meaning that the influence of this guy to this guy is, is very little negligible, so all these spins actually are pointing to the main field direction, and then I add up the contribution. Well, I get a maximum contribution, okay? Because remember, I'm doing a vector sum. Each spin is a little vector, so I'm doing the vector sum. So when I add them up, if all these guys are pointing to the same direction, I'm getting the maximum signal. But, but that's not a reality. Reality is that these guys are close to each other. Okay, because these are atoms. So you have this, this spin, okay, right, right, up, right outside this atom, it's another atom, so this guy is going to influence this guy, and you have those, these guys close to each other. And now they, they actually, they, you know, they, they are influenced by each other, and they spread out, the vectors actually spread out like this. So when you again do the vector sum, so then what's the, uh, so what, what is the vector sum of this, this, you know, say, of these 10 spins? Well, of course, you get lower value, right? Okay, any question? I mean, I, I'm just stop for a minute here. Okay, so this, this is important. So because of this, then you are getting actually a smaller value, okay? And, I mean, smaller signal. So then the way to, okay, I guess it's not on this slide. So then basically you are getting a smaller signal because of these spin-spin interaction. Okay, so we call that T2 interaction. Now because the signal becomes less as a function of time, okay, so when the time you know, becomes longer and longer, actually the signal just keep dropping well, because all these guys are, again, you, know, you, you influence one guy, this guy influences other guys, actually also influence the previous guy, okay. So when you wait longer and longer, the signal just keeps dropping. And because of that, we use this time T2 to uh, describe this problem. Okay. Now, of course, there's, so then what's, what's this dephasing uh, that the, the book is talking about? All right, so now just imagine, these guys, of course, already, you know, does what they are doing, even without the main field. Okay, now imagine that I have all these spins on the transverse plane, okay, and I have the main field going this way. I have these spins on the transverse plane. Okay, so now the first thing is, is again, if there's no interactions between these guys, okay, and, and, and don't worry about the T1 regrowth, okay, just forget about the T1 regrowth for a minute. So say these spins are on the transverse plane, I have the main field pointing this way. What will these guys, these spins do? Well, these guys, of course, will just precess 
clockwisely you know, around this main field, okay? just like what you have learned in chapter two. Okay, but because of these interactions, okay, so not everybody is going to precess around the same direction, right? Some, some spin will precess this way. Some spins actually may go the other way just because of the, these interactions. So again, these vectors can be, in fact, you know, further uh, apart. Okay. But that's really due to the interactions between these guys. Okay? It has nothing to do with the main field. The main field just, you know, just let all these spins precess around this main field. In fact, if you put ourselves uh, put yourself in the rotating frame. You don't. You won't see this main guy, right? Okay. So, so the book is just saying that, okay, if, if all these spins are spreading out on the transverse plane, then that is called defacing. Okay. So, uh, so the question is why the animation is not doing anything. Oh, is it doing? Okay, that's very funny. Um, it's not doing anything actually on the computer screen. Okay, so this T2 decay, uh, T2 interaction, okay, or spin spin interaction, the way to model this is actually easier. Okay, so you look at the first bullet, and without that T2 term, okay, so meaning that if you neglect the T2 term, that is, of course, the Bly equation I just showed you. And then we have the transverse component, meaning that that M perg just represents the vector of mx and my. Okay. Now, because of the T2 decay, so we have to add that. And then, so we basically just add that minus uh, m perp divided by T2. Okay. So, now if you put, so if there's no RF pulse, no, uh, oh, sorry, we, we must have the main field. So let's say if there's no RF pulse, and then we put ourselves in the rotating frame, then you get the equation uh, of the second bullet, okay, so that's the uh, dm per dt and prime. Prime refers to the rotating frame. is just equals to minus m per divided by t2. All right, so then that's easy because then you know the, the uh, solution of that differential equation. It's just a t2 decay. Oh. So if you plot it, you plot this function. So at the very beginning, of course, you, you have the maximum value, okay, and then when the time goes on, I mean, so this is this guy, when the time goes on, obviously, the exponential term just kill your, your signal, the, your signal goes down to zero. So now if you put the T1 regrow and the T2 decay together in a simulation, well, then this is what you're, you're seeing here. That's the animation. Okay, so you can see that actually it, it goes down very quickly but then recovers very slowly. Okay, now the, uh, okay, so now let's look at the uh, T1 and T2 of these uh, tissues. Okay, now, so you say, well, why, why is this important? Well, actually, this turns out to be important because all the contrast, all the contrast you have seen from MR images are based on these uh, numbers, okay? But how do we get these numbers? Well, okay, in fact, you have to measure them. You have to design your, your sequences in, in order to measure these T1, T2 values, okay? Um, now, how, how to actually really measure these values? Okay, that, that's actually a little bit uh, complicated, okay? And I think, uh, but I think you will learn that actually in chapter 15. Uh, but chapter 15 just tells you theoretically how you can measure these numbers, okay? In, in practice, in fact, this July, you know, we went to the NIST meeting, and I just heard that, you know, there are still a whole bunch of problems, actually, when people try to measure T1 and T2. There are many, many issues, actually, people have to consider, okay? Uh, there are, there are uh, for example, the pulse sequence issue and hardware issue and post-processing issue, um, you, you have to worry about all those things in order to have the correct measurements of T1 and T2. Okay. And another thing is that these numbers 
Here uh, are basically the numbers in the past people measure from 1.5 Tesla. If you measure the same, even the same person, okay, same tissues of the same person at a different field strength, let's say three Tesla, some of these numbers actually will be different. Okay. Now, another thing is that you also have to be careful what sequences actually people use to measure these T1, T2 values. Okay, so even let's say you have the same machine, same 1.5 Tesla machine, and same, uh, oh, sorry, actually different sequences, uh, say 2D sequence or the 3D sequence. Well, in fact, you can also get different values. Okay, so that's kind of, uh, I mean, not exactly, but this is kind of, you know, showing, say, in, in the blood, in that case, you, know, you can see a little bit difference. So just give you a, so I'm just giving you a rough idea, say, okay, these numbers actually can be different if you are at different field strength and using different sequences, and you have to be very careful. Okay, and then, uh, and then in terms of the T1 weighted sequence, what, what is the meaning of the T1 weighted sequence? What's the meaning of the T2 weighted sequence? What's the meaning of the spin density weighted sequence? Uh, images, uh, you, you will learn those things actually in chapter 15, and also then a little bit actually from uh, chapter 18. Okay. So we're not talking about those things today. Okay, but but then, you know, let's look at these numbers, okay? Why these numbers actually give us an idea, you know, why uh, this is important in MRI and why we are able to get actually different contrast just from these numbers, okay? So let's, for example, let's look at the T1 first, okay? So now let's go back to that equation. Uh, okay, this little equation here, right? So you look at this, this T1 value, Okay, so also here. So if this T1 value is, say, very short, then of course, then you say, well, okay, then the inverse of this is, is big, and meaning that a little bit of time just, will just kill that term, kill that term, and I actually get the uh, full recovery of this uh, M0. Okay, so okay, so very quickly, just from this mathematical uh, equation, you see that if I have a very short T1 of a particular tissue, then I will quickly, this uh, uh, magnetization will quickly recover, will quickly realign itself back to the main field direction. Okay. If the T1 is very long, then it's going to take forever <coughs> for this, for this uh, spin to come back to align itself to the z direction. Okay. So, okay. So what does that mean? Well, okay, so this means that, well, later on, when you learn some different uh, sequences, you know, when you start, say, okay, try to design sequences, you can adjust timing. You can use different timing and such that uh, you, um, such that you, you can change the contrast of your tissues because in the next chapter, I mean, sorry, not the next one, in the next lecture, we are going to, uh, in chapter seven, we are going to talk about how we are going to acquire signal. I mean, just uh, again, from the theoretical point of view. And basically all these signals will be acquired when they are on the transverse plane. Okay, again, the field goes in this way. Your, the protons are on the transverse plane, and this is where we, are, we can acquire signal. So if the T1 actually comes back very quickly, well, then you have to do something very quick. Okay? Otherwise, you are going to lose signal. Okay, so now let's take a look at this table. Okay, so then it's, it's, so then it's this. So let's say if you want to, uh, okay, fat, okay. So let's say if you want to image fat, and fat has a very short T1, pretty short T1, you know, compared to anything else, then you will say, oh, yeah, so the, sig the fat signal is going to recover very fast, meaning that the fat signal is going to realign itself back to the main field very quickly. On the contrary, you look at this uh, the CSF, okay, CSF 
in the middle, and that's basically contains water. That's basically water. So T1 of water is very, very long. Then it takes almost like forever for this CSF signal to recover. Okay. But then but then you know, of course, then you are going to have a question, you know, for some of you who may have jumped ahead and say, Oh, you have heard about the T1 weighted sequence or T1 weighted image from the T1 weighted image, uh, the fat signal actually looks very bright. The CSF signal, in fact, looks very, very dark. Okay, so that kind of contradicts to what I just told you, right? Okay, no, it's not that. Okay, there are two things. One is that, okay, we really have to talk about what is the equation for T1 weighted sequence. Okay, for T1 weighted sequence, it turns out that the dominant term is 1 over T1. So that's what's happening. So all of a sudden, because of that, the shorter the T1, the higher the signal from the uh, from a T1 weighted uh, image. Okay. But again, I'm not getting into there today. Okay, that's the uh, that's that will be the purpose uh, for chapter uh, 15. Or actually, maybe on the way, you know, chapter 8, you may, you may have already seen something. Okay, don't remember. Exactly. Okay, and then for uh, T2, okay, these numbers, okay, now remember the T2 decay, right? Okay, so just back to this equation. Okay, so we have that T2 decay. So it's very obvious. If you have a very long T2, well, then what? Then that, uh, you have a very long T2, then actually then it decays slowly. It means that the signal will kind of stay on the transverse plane, okay? If you have a very short T2, then you are going to lose signal very quickly. So, okay, so now look at this. Okay, so again, for CSF, for water, water has a very long T2. Okay, so it's great. It's like, okay, your, your sequence can be pretty long. You can wait for a long time, okay? You, you uh, use your RF pulse, tip down all these spins onto a transverse plane, you can actually wait for a long time, you know, and because the water signal will still be there. It will not really decay because of a very long T2. But if you want to image, let's just say muscle, okay, or blood, or anything else, you'll find that you have to these you have to actually acquire your signal from the sequence fairly quickly. Okay. On what order of time? Okay, so that's important. You look at the T2, okay, except for the CSF, right? All values are around, say, 100 milliseconds. So that's pretty much, uh, you know, why, say, okay, in MR we have this echo time, okay? Why these echo times actually are pretty much, actually, you, you barely actually see some echo time longer than, say, 100 milliseconds. Okay. Even unless actually you have a T2 weighted sequence, of course, then you, you really go beyond that, okay? It's really, so that is actually the first thing. You don't want to have a very long echo time, okay? Otherwise, you, you are going to lose signal. You're, you're not going to have, because of the T2 decay, you're not going to have s sufficient signal left, okay? And then, of course, then you are going, then you, you have the same question. You are going to ask me, well, what is T1 going to do? Okay, so this recovery has, something to do with how you are going to repeat your sequence, okay? So that's, that's the part actually in chapter 18 you, you will see, okay? So again, I'm not getting into there today. So any questions for this? Oh, um, yeah, another thing is just, you know, have a rough idea about the order of magnitude. So for T2, basically, yeah, if you say the T2 of, say, tissues, Okay, that is about 100 milliseconds, as you see here. And T2 of water is very long. T2 of water is actually on the order of 1,000 milliseconds, meaning that about a second. Now, if you are talking about T2 of solids, that will be very short. Okay, then we are talking about uh, one millisecond that uh, order, or even shorter than that. Okay, now for T1, uh, for these tissues, as you can see, these numbers are about 1,000 milliseconds. 
So again, it's about uh, one second. Okay, and, and don't worry about the uh, the T1 from fat. I mean, don't worry. Just means that you know. Just remember, actually, fat has a very very short T1. Okay, so it's not in the same order of magnitude. Um, and and in general, actually, T1 even for for solids, T1 is always uh, longer than T2. Okay, so that is actually a general trend. So, so the basic things are, okay, so I'll just repeat this thing again. T1 is longer than T2 in general for tissues, for, the, uh, for your interest. T1 of tissues is about the order of one second. T2 is on the order of 100 millisecond, roughly, okay, for most tissues. For water and fat, these are two uh, different uh, anomalies. Okay, so the next thing is then we have to, then now, you know, we'll talk about what is actually T2 prime and T2 star, okay? So all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're getting uh, more and more uh, strange stuff here. Okay, so this T2 prime is actually due to the external uh, magnetic field. Okay, so, so then, you know, I have to be careful here. So I'm not talking about the main field, this uh, big field, okay? So what are we talking about? All right, so imagine the following. Again, I have, I have the main field here, all right? I have the little spin here, and now if I purposely actually use another current loop and induce the gradient, that's the additional field we are talking about, okay? Or imagine that I have this little spin here, I have the main field here, I have, let's say, uh, a big nanoparticle here, okay? So it's not a nanoparticle anymore. It's a big particle here. And it will actually produce some static field. Okay? And that's the, you know, kind of the static field I'm, I'm talk, talking about, you know, the external magnetic fields okay? produced by something else, not by these spins, but by something else, okay? So, so then you can imagine, okay, so if I have something, some other external field, something else, I put it here, I have this little spin here, and if this guy actually produce a very strong magnetic field, okay, doesn't need to be very strong, just sufficiently strong enough, such that you, this magnetic field will influence this spin, then, of course, it's going to either, again, you know, repel this guy, right, or attract this guy. Either way, you are, and, and, and the bad news is this, okay, it's not just this spin here. We have a whole bunch of spins because, again, all these guys, uh, are, each one actually is from one atom. And, and you know, atoms, I mean, you know, in one material, in one sample, all these atoms are close to each other. So when I have, say, an external source of the magnetic field here, this field is going to basically go through all these spins. So these spins are going to be further uh, influenced. And then you can imagine, yeah, we probably have further signal loss because of this external guy, okay? Now the good news is this. Okay, so the good news is that what's going to happen to, to, these, to these guys due to this external source. Well, you can imagine if I somehow, well, okay, so now let's, let's just, um, okay, so, so let's say, okay, I have this guy, right? But then the field influence from this guy basically will force, or say will move, will, will let these spins process along the same direction. So let's just say, I put down, say, okay, first thing is I have the main field, I have the RF pulse, I rotate these spins onto the transverse plane. Turn off the RF pulse, okay, no RF pulse anymore. These guys are going to process like this, right? I just have the main field. Okay, don't worry about the, don't worry about the T2 interaction for a minute, okay? So if I just have these spins, I have the main field going this direction, these spins are going to process clockwisely this way, okay? Same rate, okay, now, I have an external field 
but this external field is doing something a little bit slightly different, okay? So, so at different locations, I have five different locations, but, but remember these five locations are very close to each other, okay? They are just off by an atom size. So these guys are on the transverse plane, but the field at this point, okay, the field, this uh, external field is still pointing to the z direction, but they have a, but this external field has a spatial distribution, meaning that at this point, I have a slightly different field strength. At this point, I have a slightly different, also a, a, a different field strength compared to this one, okay? So for this, so for this, so for that. So these five different locations, in fact, have five different field strength due to this additional field, not the main field, but this additional field I added. Then these five spins are going to precess. Okay, they were they were still pretty much precess, actually clockwisely this way, but they are going to go by different rate. Right? Why is that? Okay, remember what we learned in chapter two. We learned that if I have a field going this way, I have these spins precessing this direction. What is the rate? You know. The frequency, these guys will precess. Huh? Dependent on the magnetic field. Yes, right, right. Depending on the magnetic field, right, right. So what's the equation which describes the this frequency? You know, from chapter two. Right. It's the Lama equation. Okay. So it's gamma times b. So just doesn't matter what kind of b field I put it here. Okay. If I have. Uh, you know, if I double the B field, then yeah, the precession rate is going to be doubled, okay? But of course, it's not that crazy. So I have this main field, which is B now. I have this additional field, whatever that is. And, but if, they, if this additional field actually gives me uh, different fields at these five different locations, then they are going to precess, in fact, at five different frequencies. Okay, the problem is that you cannot distinguish these five different frequencies when you are doing MRI or say even an MR. Okay, now why is that? Okay, well, you know until I show you the equation in chapter seven, then you will realize that all we are getting is in fact is the the sum, the vector sum of these five vectors. Okay, so then you say, well, okay, but then but then the physics is this. First of all, they precess at five different frequencies. Just go like this, okay? And then, so then you, you say, well, okay, then what can I do if I don't want to lose signal? Because if they process at five different frequencies, you wait longer and longer, you are going to lose your signal, right? It's just like you have five vectors. If you wait longer and these guys become further and further apart, you try to calculate the vector sum you get less and less magnitude signal, okay? So then you say, what can I do? Well, all right, one thing you can do is you can try to apply later what we call the spin echo, okay? So that's the, so that's why I wrote here. It's more about chapter eight, okay? But just give you a, a rough idea. So you say, okay, if you can somehow just flip these spins, well, okay, flip, you know, flip means what? I have to apply again. I have to now rely on my RF pulse again, okay? Because remember what we learned from chapter three is that this RF pulse can, you know, originally I, I rotate these spins from, from this direction to the transverse plane because of the RF pulse, okay? I, I apply the RF pulse. Now, actually, you have to think carefully, right? I say which direction actually the RF pulse I'm applying. Well, okay. I apply the RF, so originally these spins goes this way. RF pulse has to be that direction in the rotating frame, such that these spins will precess, will rotate this direction onto the transverse plane, okay, clockwisely, okay, onto the transverse plane. Okay, now I turn off this uh, RF pulse. Now you let these five guys precess at some point, at some time, okay? But then you can imagine, hey, if I just apply another RF pulse, 
but now this time pointing to what direction, right? Okay, you can again apply the RF pulse, say this direction, then what will these guys do? Well, these guys will now actually process going like this, right? Okay, so now if you let these guys actually flip, just go around 180 degrees to this way, all right, now then turn off this RF pulse again. But you still have the main field. So these five guys now are going to, again, precise clockwisely, so they will go this way. Okay, so then it does one thing, right? Originally, these guys comes down this way, precise a little bit like that, apply the RF pulse, so flip to this way, you rotate it back. Now remember, you still have this external field. So again, these five guys are going to experience well, basically, the you know basically actually hey the the same frequency except that actually now they are going this direction right, it's still clockwise okay going this direction instead of going this direction so they are moving this way rather than this way so again because they are moving at the same fre I mean okay, okay different frequencies these five guys are going to move at different frequencies okay here right and then but then now backwards this way but going this way so they are going to actually align themselves back to where they were I mean, not not this far okay let, let's let's say just here okay so originally I have them here tip down like this going up a little bit like that flip again back to here then going back a little bit and they come back to basically the same uh, position because your the external field just gives me the same uh, frequency shift but say the phase shift but then waiting the same time they all these vectors will come together again so now this this 180 degree RF pulse is called the pi pulse Okay. But anyway, you learned that again in chapter A. Here I'm just t just actually letting you know that this T2 prime, meaning that I have an external field, and if you let it keep going, then you're going to lose a signal. Okay? But there is a way, because this is an external field, so there is a way you can imagine, you can say, okay, I can, I can use a spinnacle pulse and refocus these guys. Right. So that's that's what I want to tell you. Okay, but now you probably ask a question: Why can we do the same thing? If I have five spins here, why can I do the same thing? You know, if if this guy is influencing this guy, this guy is influencing this guy, this guy of course influencing back to this guy. If I have five guys, you know, here, why can I actually do the same thing? I somehow try to design uh, an external field and such that I just just try to bring up all these guys and then I get actually a very strong field, I get rid of this T2 decay. Well, the answer is it's, it's very hard, right? You, you can imagine, you know, this guy is going to influence this guy, this guy is, I mean, you know, back and forth, I mean, okay. So you want to design just uh, an external field to do this. Uh, yeah, okay, you, you can try, I mean, but you can imagine it's not going to be easy. Okay? But just give you an idea, you know, I think those people who are designing the quantum uh, computer, okay, so when they are playing those uh, uh, qubits, and that's what they, they have to do. Okay, they have to really control the motion of each spin. Okay, now I don't remember how many qubits they can control now. Okay, I think it's probably four or, or eight or something. I, I probably four. Okay, that's so, but but that's basically what they have to do. So you can imagine how how difficult that that will be. Okay, so um, so we have this T two prime decay. So basically, the T two prime decay is due to an external field source. Now you have this additional decay, then you then you say, okay, then I will include that actually in my Bly equation. Okay, so and then you add actually this way. Why is that? Okay, let's go back to. So here is what I said. Okay, if you go back to the Bly equation here, uh, the one on the top. Right now, this this T two is ba is just it has a unit of time, and in there actually you see it is actually one over T two. So if you have T two prime 
decay, meaning that due to the additional external field, okay, just keep adding one more turn. So that's why here, that's why here, we're just adding, you know, one over T2 prime plus one over T2. And this whole thing, we're just calling that one over uh, T2 star. Okay. Now that's if, uh, okay, I'm no, sorry, then, then let, let me finish this. And then you can just, again, just definitely, you can define these terms, right? You can say, okay, uh, one over T2 is R2, we call that relaxation rates, okay? And, and T1, T2, T2 prime, all these has, uh, have units in time, okay? And then so, but when we say relaxation rates, then it's those R2, R2 prime, R2 star. Okay, they are just inverse of T2 because now they have units of uh, inverse of, of time, inverse of seconds, okay, um, or hertz. Um, okay, now the the T2 or this uh, T2 star decay or T2 prime, these things actually are from the uh, AMR. So in the old, so this again, you know, back to uh, say. Uh, probably 50s, 40s. And those people, of course, they just measure a uniform sample in M from AMR. Okay, so when you have a uniform sample and you try to measure, oh, what's, what's T2 decay, uh, what's, uh, yeah, pretty much let's just say T2 decay. Then yes, you, you, you get actually, you pretty much say, oh yeah, I'll probably get actually an exponential decay. Okay? Not quite, okay? um, but pretty much actually that's a pretty good model. But then, of course, you know, things are not always simple, right? You know, you, you, you don't sometimes, you, you don't always actually have a uniform sample. You can have some materials, I mean, some uh, heterogeneous material in a test tube. Then, yeah, you actually, then you may start to see not a, a very nice exponential decay. Okay? You're going to see actually something funny in that curve. And, and in MRI, of course, you know, from, the imaging point of view, yeah, you can imagine, you know, we have, say in the brain, you know, we have so many different tissues in there, then yes, and the answer will also be different. Meaning that you may not have a simple T2 decay. Okay, and then the, uh, the rest of this uh, chapter four is again, you know, say, okay, just how to solve this block equation, right? Because now uh, I, I kind of mentioned to you, I say, okay, the Bly equation you learn in chapter two is the simplest form. So you look at the first bullet. Okay, the simplest form is that you just have d and dt equals to gamma m cross b effective. Okay, because we are putting ourselves in the rotating frame. So don't worry about t1, t2. In this chapter, all right, you learn t1 recovery, you learn t2 decay. So you add those two things in the Bly equation. Okay. You may also remember that I said you know, if I have done your homework problem in chapter two, then you know if you don't have T1 regrow or T2 decay, if you don't have those two terms, then the magnitude of your spin or the magnitude of your, your spin ensemble, meaning that, that magnetization M, is the magnitude of that magnetization is not going to change through the function of time. But when you have this, uh, you know, T1 re regrow and T2 decay, especially T2 decay, then actually the magnitude of your uh, magnetization or even a spin is going to change through the function of time. Okay. Now if you don't believe me, that's very simple. So the first thing is if we just consider B equals uh, the, your B field just has the main field, you don't have the RF pulse, okay? Forget about the RF pulse, you don't have RF pulse. You just have the main field like this, your spins, okay, say they are um, at whatever initial state. You solve the block, your block equation will look like basically this, okay? And then, now if these T1, T2, omega naught are all constants, if all these guys are constants, then here are, here are the solutions. And if you don't believe me, just calculate, you know, just calculate the magnitude of this uh, magnetization, okay, you have mx, my, mz components, so you have to calculate the magnitude of the component and plot that as a function of time, you're going to see the 
magnitude of this magnetization is going to be reduced because of, at least because of that T2 decay. Okay, and then the, uh, then similarly, just similar to what you have learned in chapter two, okay, so then in order to solve this, okay, back to here, in order to solve this Bly equation, well, you can imagine for the X component and the Y component, you can again rewrite that in terms of the complex form, the complex number of that form, so you can define M plus equals to mx plus imy, all right, so then you have uh, this, then you can solve that Bly equation by doing this, and okay, it's a little bit quicker. And, but nonetheless, actually, you're still going to get the same solution, okay? It's not going to be different, it's just you just have a different mathematical representation, but anyway, it's the same thing. And here, uh, this is the uh, m perpendicular, uh, but that's just, represent the magnitude, so here, that's the definition of this uh, M perpendicular, that's just the magnitude of the transverse part of your magnetization, so it contains the T2 decay, and this is your initial state, okay, and also you have this uh, uh, phase term, you, again, you'll see that. Okay, and then this is kind of the last slide, uh, in this chapter, okay, so now if we make this more complicated, right, because I said, well, okay, uh, I said forget about the RF pulse for a minute, right, but in reality, you do have the RF pulse because you have these spins, so I have the field pointing this way, I have all these spins at the very beginning, say, pointing toward the Z direction. I apply the RF pulse pointing this way in the um, uh, rotating frame, these spins will be rotated down to the transverse plane. Okay, during this process, if I also have to consider the T1 regrowth and T2 decay, then that's my Bly equation, okay, with the uh, B1 field, so that's the omega one. Uh, now remember that omega one is actually gamma times B1. Okay, now, uh, if all these uh, T1, T2, and omega 1, and delta omega, okay, remember delta omega is just the difference between omega naught and omega. Okay, now omega naught is your lama frequency due to the main field, okay, omega naught is your gamma times B naught. And omega is, say, okay, just the, uh, the this, uh, rotation frequency of your your rotation of your rotating frame between the laboratory frame and the rotating frame. Okay, that gives you that omega. So if those guys, if those coefficients, yeah, actually that's the term I want to say. If all those coefficients are constants, then in fact you can solve this Bly equation analytically. Okay, that that's actually not a problem. Okay, you. You know, if you are interested in that, you can just do that by yourself. Uh, okay, and there is a simple way actually to solve that. Um, and actually, there was a paper, okay, but anyway, you, you can. But this thing is actually something you can solve it. But the bad news is, actually, that's not reality either, okay? Why is that? Because, okay, T1, T2 are pretty much, you can treat T1, T2 as constants. Okay, that's not a problem. And that's because RF pulse usually is pretty f uh, fast. But the problem, the biggest problem is that your omega one, meaning that the field of your RF pulse, that B1 field is not a constant. Your, your B1 field, in fact, also changes as a function of time. And I'm talking about the B1 field in the rotating frame. Okay, I'm not talking about the B1 field in the laboratory frame. Because in the laboratory frame, of course, the B1 field has to rotate as well. That's what we learned from chapter three. Okay, if I don't rotate my, uh, if I don't rotate my uh, RF field, then I'm going to create that delta omega, then I'm going to lose my signal. So normally I will not do that. Okay, 
But even so, even just in the rotating frame, if I have my RF pulse, my RF pulse actually is not uh, constant. My RF pulse also changes as a function of time. And the reason is, okay, so then you, you, you must ask me why is that, right? Okay, the reason is, okay, this reason, in fact, is given in chapter 16, okay? And bad news is that we don't teach that. And so then you say, oh, okay, you know, what, what's going on in there? Well, what we try to do in, in MR is that we use this RF pulse, and we later on you will learn from, uh, uh, you know, either chapter eight or chapter nine, when we use the RF pulse, we try to excite one volume, you ch or say one slice. You try to get actually a tri I mean, uh, sorry, a rectangular shape of the of the slice. Okay? So that is actually uh, why this RF pulse has to be has to change as a function of time. If you don't do that, when you try to excite a volume or say a slice, that slice is not going to have a good rectangular shape. So meaning that if you just actually apply a constant RF pulse, well, guess what? You are going to excite uh, a slice region and whose profile, in fact, will look like a Gaussian function or a sink function. That's what you are going to see. Okay? And you don't like that because you normally say, oh, I want to image here, or say I want to image here. I really just want to see the signals from here. I don't want to get signals from here or here. So that's why that's important. Okay, but, but the bad news is, is really that. All right, so that's, uh, so in this chapter, okay, you are not dealing with that, okay? But in, rea in reality, that's what you have to deal with. And um, so anyway, so in this chapter, we are just talking about uh, two, at the end of this chapter, we are just talking about two simple cases. One is the, why it is called the short-lived RF pulse. Okay, doesn't matter. The point is, your your omega one is zero, okay? Or actually, there is there is no interaction terms or no delta omega. Well, okay, for that actually, you also know how to solve it because in chapter three, I show you in one slide. Okay, very quickly, I said if there there are no trans, I mean, sorry, no T one D. Uh, no T2 decay, no T1 regrow, and if it is on randomness, even if omega 1 is a function of time, you can solve your Bly equation. The answer is, in fact, the, the angle, okay, the angle, in fact, is integral of this gamma B1 over time T. Okay, so that, actually, you can solve. Okay, so if there's no R pulse, and even with the relaxation terms, okay, and that's what I said. If everybody, if all the coefficients are constant, you can solve that. It's not a problem, okay. And but that's that situation is just like okay, I have all these spins, I use the RF pulse, tip down all these spins onto a transverse plane, I turn off the RF pulse. At that point, what are these spins? Where are these spins going to move? Okay, so that's the situation for this. Now the second situation is that what they call the long lived RF pulse. Okay, it just means that okay, all the derivatives are zero, meaning that you are now reaching a steady state. You are reaching some kind of equilibrium such that all those derivatives are zero. All right, then then your left hand side of this Bly equation is zero. Okay, then you just try to solve a, a matrix um, equation. That's all. So, um, but again, these, these are just mathematics, okay? And, and that's what uh, you have to go through. Okay, so any questions for this chapter? Uh, yes. we have two signals, T2 and T2, and we know the T1 of T2 is greater than T1 of T2. Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean in just in just comparing the T2 of two different tissues? Yes, if you know the T1. Oh, if you know the T1, uh, that's still hard to predict. I, I think from, if let's see, okay, if we go back, sorry. Um, 
if you go back to this table, I guess yeah, there is no uh, yeah, there's no uh, fixed relation. Well, let's see. Um, yeah, see, just between say white matter and the muscle, see that this number is bigger than that, but this number is smaller than that. But compared to uh, between gray matter and white matter, right? See that the uh, the T one of gray matter is bigger than the white matter, but T two of the gray matter is also larger than white matter. So yeah, so there is no uh, no uh, fixed relation there. Any other questions? Okay. No. Okay. Then. Uh, Okay, then we'll go on to this uh, chapter five. Okay, well, it's not the entire chapter five, as, as I said. Okay, well, basically, we will just talk about um, section 5.1 and a little bit of uh, section 5.2. Okay? After that, the quantum mechanics, yeah, you really want to learn that, you have to <laughs> learn that from physics. So in this chapter, okay, we're going to talk about the uh, Stern and Galak experiment. And then the just quickly explain what's the Zeeman splitting, and okay, and then the transition energy, and then also the force on the magnetic moment. Okay, so this is the the experiment in twenties in nineteen twenties. <laughs> Sorry, I guess it's going to be uh, what you know twenty twenty. Um, okay, but this was nineteen twenties. So these two uh, professors, okay, Stern and Galak, and they, they try to, uh, according to the textbook, it says that they try to actually find out, uh, try to find out the quantum number from electrons. Okay, I, actually, you know, I, I, I have a little bit doubt about that. You know, I, maybe, maybe after class, you know, we can we can check the uh, what Wikipedia says. <laughs> But but okay. But anyway, the fact is, they they establish well. Actually, they set up this uh, uh, magnetic field, and then they shoot a new neutral silver atom through that magnetic field. Okay. And now, why why do they why did they actually choose the silver atom? Okay. I, so basically, they have this. So basically, okay. First of all, you know, uh, for for a silver atom, it has uh, one electron out there, and then of course, it's for in terms of the uh, uh, protons and neutrons, you know, you have many. Okay. And so they, I think, yeah, if I remember correctly, I think they purposely actually choose a large atom because. They thought that they might actually observe not a splitting signal. They thought they might observe actually just one signal after they shoot this silver beam through that magnetic field. They might see actually just one spot on the detector. I think it was a screen or something. And or actually they might just see a spread of the of of the signals or or or, or say uh, particles, but it turns out that when after they shot this silver atom through the magnetic field, they got two distinguished uh, splits spots on on the detector on the screen. Okay? So that was actually a proof of this. Uh, basically, the say the quantum states of electrons. Oh, well, actually, they are actually you just have one electron in each atom. So, you know, other than that, there was no way to explain why you would actually get two uh, states out of this neutralized silver atom. Okay, so then the the modern language is to say this. The modern language is to say that, okay, you have electron in this uh, silver orbit, and this electron actually has two quantum states. One is the spin up state, the other guy is the spin down state. And then 
they have different quantum numbers. Okay, basically we assign different quantum numbers to the electrons, and that's what uh, this experiment is showing. Okay, and uh, and again that equation, you know, mu equals to gamma j. Okay, we saw that in chapter two, and this that is basically a relation between the magnetic moment and the angular momentum. Okay, but here that equation, in fact, is also true for electrons. Okay, so for electrons, actually, it's uh, it's simpler. You just have one electron, and for that, you just have two states. So that uh, so the uh, the J Z component, in fact, the Z component of this angular momentum is just that little m times h bar. Okay, h divided by two pi is h bar. H is the uh, Planck constant, and m actually is the quantum number. And in the modern days, actually, we assign m to be, in this case, for an electron, we assign m to be either positive half or negative half. Okay, and then the j square, all that discussions, that's just about the, um, how do you combine the, the uh, um, angular momentum and the spin, and but, but here you know we don't need to get into those things. Okay, and then the, this Zeeman effect. Okay, the Zeeman effect is okay. So originally I have the uh, I have this atom. Okay, I have the uh, basically there's no energies, um, no splitting of the energy state. I just have say um, maybe electrons. Actually, is a better way to say it. Okay, so I just have. Actually, electrons in the in the hydrogen, uh, say in this hydrogen orbit. Now, when we apply an external field, then actually we are going to create different energy states. And okay, so for the simple one, meaning that if I just have one electron out there, well, then we will create basically two states. Now this is just again using a figure to represent these two states, but they are in fact associated with this uh, quantum mechanics, the quantum numbers we are talking about. So these two states, one is we call that the uh, spin up state, and turns out that actually this spin up state is at the lower energy level. Well, that's actually what we call that because at a, say half an hour ago, okay, I said, all right, what's the definition of the potential energy? Well, the potential energy is equal to minus mu dot b. So if I have a little spin here, and I have the main field going this way, if my little magnet, I mean, my little spin is in parallel to the main field, then I have lower energy because mu dot b, okay, so the product gives me actually the bigger number, but I have a minus sign in front of it. It's minus mu dot b. So I have a minus sign in front of it, then it gives me actually the smaller value in terms of uh, energy. So for the spin up, in fact, we have a, a lower state, and lower energy state, okay? and But the quantum number to label this spin up state is actually half, it's positive half. Okay, so that's uh, important to know. And then the other state will be the anti parallel state or the spin down state. And this anti parallel state, okay, again, you know, if we use, use this minus mu dot b, well, then of course I'm going to get. Uh, higher energy level, so that's why the, in the drawing here, we just have a higher energy level to represent this uh, spin down state or the anti-parallel state. Okay. And the, but the quantum number for this guy is actually minus half. Okay. But in terms of the energy level, okay, so for the, uh, for the spin up state, the energy level is Okay, so this is kind of, again, funny, I mean, okay, difficult, right? Because for the energy level, it is defined as minus, and then that, that little m, and then times h 
bar omega naught. Okay. So that is, well, where is that from? Okay, now remember I have this uh, minus mu dot b, right? Okay, so what's mu? All right, now if I go back to here, mu is gamma times j, and then so what's j? j is actually m times that h bar. So pull it together. Okay, pull it together, I have gamma times n times h bar. That's my mu. Okay, I have mu dot b. So I have gamma times n times h bar times b with a minus sign in front of it. Okay, and gamma times b is my omega naught. So I end up with minus m times h bar times omega naught. That's my energy. So my, my energy level is minus m times h bar times omega naught. So for the spin up state, the energy becomes minus, okay, now my m is positive half. So it's minus m h bar omega naught. Okay. Now if I have, if m is equal to minus half for the spin down state, then my energy level becomes positive half h bar omega naught. Okay. So, so then, okay, so then the next slide, basically we'll just say, okay, then what is actually the energy difference between these two states? Well, okay, that's obvious, right? So what's the difference of the energy between these two states? Well, this minus that gives you h bar omega naught. And also, uh, yeah, so this transition energy, right? So this transition energy just means that uh, the energy from this uh, spin up state to the spin down state, because the, you always act, well, I cannot say always, okay? But in this case, if I have, uh, say, an electron at the uh, upper state, but then it tries to say minimize the energy, then you will goes down to the lower state and then release the energy. Okay. Now of course, if you do some uh, photo uh, electronic experiments, well okay, you, you, you know you shoot a, you add some energy through this uh, uh, through some lights, then you can also kick the uh, electrons from the lower state to the upper state. Okay, now the, uh, okay, this one is, okay, the force on the magnetic moment. Okay, so basically, we, again, you will see the same equation, energy equals to minus mu dot B. Okay, so how do we define force? Okay, one way to define force is force is equals to, uh, by definition, is minus gradient of the energy. Okay, so then you put the equation together, you get gradient uh, of mu dot B. Now normally, mu, because it's from one single spin, so mu is not a function of space. So as we wrote here, if you look at the z component of the, of the force, then this is what you are getting because B field in general is a function of space. So if you just look at the force of a single uh, spin, then this is basically what you are getting. Okay, but you have to be a little bit careful. Uh, so back to the third bullet. Okay, you have to be a little bit careful. If I have a whole bunch of spins, then uh, then basically we are talking about the magnetization M. Then in that case, actually, you have when you calculate the force from the second bullet, you replace that mu by M. Then you have to be very careful because now. Uh, your M, your magnetization is a function of space. So you cannot just move that magnetic moment outside the gradient okay, and do this. Okay, that's not going to work. Your answer will be wrong. Okay, so that's where you have to be careful. If you have uh, a material which contains so many spins, then you have to be careful. Okay, the... Uh, the last bullet actually is is important, okay, and then I'll explain this to you. 
So in MRI, we, when we talk about the gradient fields, okay, so imagine this. First of all, I have the field. Okay, the field is a vector. The B field is a vector. So then when we say gradients, okay, what do we mean by gradients? Okay, then that's complicated because B field is already the field. Gradient, normally you apply gradient actually on a scalar, right? You know, from the mathematical format, you apply gradient on a scalar. You, 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 now you have a vector, so what do you do? So then you really have to, so you can think about, you say, well, okay, then I really have to consider three different components of my B field vector. So I have the BX component, BY component, BZ component, and then I can apply gradient to each of the three components. So then I end up with actually nine numbers. Okay, so that's the mathematical definition. Okay, the good news is that in MR, unless we are talking about low field MRI, okay, but in general, we are not talking about low field MRI or earth magnetic uh, uh, field MRI. Okay, we are talking about say the clinical field, uh, 1.5 Tesla or 3 Tesla, high field MI system. In these systems, we only need to worry about the field pointing to the Z direction. Okay. Now, why is that? Okay, now there, there is also, uh, uh, I forgot in which chapter, okay, but it's a homework problem in one of the chapters actually if you do that, then you will realize that. I think that may be in chapter 25, okay? But anyway, right now, we just, let me just actually uh, talk about this definition. So, you have, I have the field pointing to the Z direction, and then, okay, so basically I just consider the Z component of the field, and then I consider the gradient of this Z component of the field, because that's, is pretty much all matters to our MRI um, uh, physics here. So when we say the, for example, the X gradient, so later on, okay, not in this chapter, not in the next chapter, but from chapter eight, uh, well, no, it's probably in chapter 10, actually. When you hear X gradient, Y gradient, Z gradient, so what's the definition of those gradient fields, okay? The definitions are here. In fact, it, so it is actually, for example, for the X gradient is partial BZ, partial X, okay? So this is important, okay? This part is very important. So when you hear X gradient, Y gradient, Z gradient uh, fields, what do they mean? They really mean partial BZ, partial X or Y or Z, okay? In toward that direction. So meaning that I have a Z component of the field, I'm calculating the changes of this Z component of field along the X direction, along the Y direction, along the Z direction. Okay. So that's what um, we are calculating. Okay, any questions for this one? All right. Okay, now this uh, chapter six, again, we we'll, we'll just talk about section 6.1. Okay, because then you have homework problems uh, to do. Okay, now the, uh, so the first thing is that we'll talk, again, we'll revisit this Curie's Law. Okay, remember I said, okay, now it's probably or, over an hour ago, I said the Curie's Law, in the Curie's Law, the, the equilibrium magnetization is proportional to the B field and inversely proportional to the temperature. And then we we'll also, just quickly talk about the spin access, um, the thermal energy, all right. Okay, so the, uh, the curious law, uh, huh. oh, okay. So the, so the curious law actually gives us this, okay. That's the uh, answer, okay. But before that, okay, so how do we actually derive, derive this thing? Well, okay, so we have to go basically all the way back to this uh, Maxwell, uh, I'm sorry, the, the uh, actually I think it's called the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. Um, so the first thing is that now we have a whole bunch of spins, okay, and I would say particles. And then we, these guys are actually in uh, an environment with temperature T. Okay, now 
we uh, okay now we say okay what how do we actually calculate uh, or say estimate this magnetization so from the statistics a statistical physics point of view we basically we have to add up the energy or say or sorry actually in this case actually we have to add up actually it's here it's a second bullet we have to add up all these uh, magnetic moments per volume okay but then we have to weight it uh, this sum with a probability function the problem is not all energy states are equal <laughs> that's a problem and so meaning that not all the spins are, are created equally when you try to figure out what is the overall magnetization you are going to uh, measure we are going to see in this system okay and then uh, this Maxwell Boseman distribution basically says okay for at different energy states you have to follow so that's the first bullet the uh, this probability function in fact is equal to this exponential I epsilon epsilon is the energy state okay minus I epsilon divided by KT K is the Boseman constant T is the uh, temperature divided by that Z capital Z capital Z is just the sum of of this uh, of, of those exponential uh, functions states okay just to normalize it because it's a probability function so that's that's the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution it's in terms in terms of statistical physics basically all these particles will distribute according to their energy states so all right okay now you probably ask me though why why is that okay if you really know want to know why is that you have to go to the physics department and learn learn uh, you know go through that course then you know then then you will know okay but for now kind of just take that as granted okay so then the magnetization so in order to figure out what is the magnetization of this say material or sample which contains so many spins then you have to add up the uh, these uh, magnetic moments but weighted by that probability function okay and then again this uh, this magnetic moment is just equals to this uh, 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 remember it is gamma times J right and J is M times H bar so okay so the answer is M times gamma times H bar okay, H bar is H divided by 2 pi and then the energy state okay we kind of also went through it's actually minus m omega h bar okay and that is also from this minus mu dot b you can derive that and this rho there rho is a, just kind of a normalization factor okay because we just say okay we add up all those numbers and but the within actually that volume so rho is just the number of particles divided by the uh, the total volume. So just gives me the correct unit for magnetization. All right. So if you put that together, and I think that's the homework problem of 6.1, uh, then you say, all right, now let's now if this energy state compared to the uh, uh, KT, K is the Boltzmann constant, T, let's say T is the room temperature, okay, or say 300 Kelvin, and you, you take that, you do this comparison, you find that, okay, this, this quantity, uh, energy divided by, energy state divided by KT is actually much, much less than one. Okay? Because of that, then you go through this math, you do the Taylor series expansion, or then you will find that this magnetization now you can actually write down an equation look like this okay. now there that that s that s just again refers to the uh, quantum I mean just the quantum number so that's the uh, the you know uh, if you if we just have uh, those spins I mean electron spins then or say proton protons in fact this is what we are talking about because in terms of magnetization we are talking about protons and they also have those energy states 
and those those small s again will be just half. Okay, that that's just the quantum number. And so then from uh, yeah, so then if you put half for this number, and this is basically what we are getting. Okay, we're just okay. Now we are getting magnetization is proportional to the external field you apply, and inversely proportional to the uh, the temperature. Okay, so that's kind of okay. So that's kind of agrees with the uh, Curie's law. Okay. But of course, you have to remember the Curie's law is true in in say kind of the first of all, it's in the classical domain. Okay, classical domain meaning that temperature is not going to be too low, because remember, if you look at this condition, if temperature is getting too low, let's say if your temperature is going down to absolute zero, then of course, you know, that term is going to blow. That's no matter what is your energy state. At some point, that quantity is going to be much larger than one, or say even close to one. Then you cannot do the expansion as you have done in this homework problem 6.1. Then you, you are not going to have this equation. So meaning that, you know, the Curie's law will not be true when the temperature is low. Okay, and then uh, and then here here is just another uh, I think uh, small thing, and also in uh, maybe you have another homework problem for this. So basically, we are just saying that okay, what is this uh, spin excess? Well, what what why do we need to know this? Well, because you probably would ask one question. I was showing you this Zeeman splitting, right? So remember, if we go back to here. Okay. So you look at this picture, and you say, "Oh, I have, uh, I have one. Uh, okay, I have one spin here. Okay, so it will be either the up st stay or the down stay. Okay. Now I have a whole bunch of spins. So naively, you probably think that, hey, if uh, all these spins are basically the same." So half of them will be pointing up, half of them will be pointing down. Well, if that's the case, then guess what? Then, uh, in fact, we will not be able to get any MR signal, okay? Because the MR signal is also proportional to the the difference of these uh, two. Uh, I mean, the, the number of spins at these two different states, okay? Meaning, meaning that. The number of protons at one state should be bigger than the number of protons at the other state. Otherwise, we are not going to see the MR signal. Okay, now of course here I'm a little bit mixing up, right? Because I was telling you all the things from the electronic, uh, from the electrons that point of view, but later I'm I'm switching now in chapter six I'm switching back to protons. But I'm using the same Zeeman effect, telling you. Uh, the same thing. Okay. Now, what's missing is this: what the quantum numbers discovered from the electrons also apply to nuclei. So that's what's missing. But now I'm telling you that that relation. Okay. So then we have to know what's the uh, the difference of the number of spins, okay, parallel to the field. So that's at the down state. And, and the number of uh, spins anti-parallel to the field, that's at the upper state, okay? So that, what's the difference of the number of um, this, the problems? Okay, so then, again, you just, okay, go through the little calculation. Okay, that's actually straightforward in the, in the textbook. And again, the problem is that it's all, again, related to this guy. Okay, so I was just rewrite, rewriting this this whole thing was your epsilon, was your your energy uh, state, okay? That that and so the energy divided by kT is actually that little u, and the the difference of the numbers is actually proportional to this n times u divided by two. Okay, so then what's that n? Well, that capital N is actually the uh, Avogadro number, so it's a big number. Okay, so even though 
u is very, very small, and because we have a large Avogadro number, then uh, this number of differences actually turns out to be pretty large. And so that's how actually we can actually uh, still detect, say, uh, signals from MRI, or say MRI provides us the signal. Okay, that's it. So any questions for this chapter? Okay, this is, yeah. Okay, so let's just uh, quickly, uh, you know, again, review what we have learned. So in this chapter, we talk about the Curie's law and the magnetization for polos. And what's important is the magnetization is proportional to the B field, inversely proportional to the time. Okay, and then we talk about spin access. Uh, thermal energy, we didn't really talk about. Okay, in chapter five, we talk about the Stern and Galak experiment. And then we talk about the Zeeman splitting for the spin half particles. Now, spin half particles, that includes both protons and electrons. Even though the stern Glack experiment was about the electrons, not protons. Okay, and then the energy, uh, the uh, transmission energy, meaning that from, for the, uh, uh, say the, the the proton, okay, from the up state, uh, sorry, from the down state, uh, sorry, from the up state, but the anti-parallel uh, state to the uh, down state, so that's the uh, up state or the parallel state, okay? And then we, and then I show you what's the force on a magnetic moment. But basically, I also told you what would be the force if you have a whole bunch of spins, okay? Meaning that if you have the magnetization M, then what should the equation look like? Okay, and then go back to chapter four. Okay, so we talk about this magnetization M. Again, you know, remember magnetization M pretty much throughout this book is actually from protons, okay? Except in chapter 25, uh, there you will see the same symbol, same magnetization, but that will be from electrons. And that's where we're talking about the magnetic susceptibility effect. Okay. And then for the Bly equation, you rewrite the Bly equation, it becomes uh, dmdt equals to gamma m cross b, and then the uh, this potential energy minus mu dot v in terms of the uh, uh, energy density, that's minus m dot v. And then we talk about the what's what's T1, uh, the T1, basically the regrowth, that's the spin lattice uh, uh, interaction, okay. and then the T2 decay, it's due to the spin-spin relaxation, okay? Of course, we also talk about what's T2 prime, what's T2 star, and the T1 recovery, that's the equation there. And then also, uh, you know, I also explain to you, I mean, say roughly, what's, what's the word about this defacing, okay? Okay, so any questions in general? Okay, so uh, yeah, so okay, so you can uh, work on your homework problem, and then uh, uh, next uh, Tuesday, your homework problem for chapter two and three will be due here.